Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Ron and Grant for episode 30... 33? 32? 32. 32. Grant, teach me something. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about... Refinancing your wraps. Wraparound mortgages are beautiful, right? Right. We have learned that for 30... One episodes, how awesome owner financing is and wraparounds. But <clears throat> one of the challenges that you run into is that you can't really effectively re or, or uh, uh, do like a traditional refinance mm -hmm. of this property once you have already sold it as a wraparound mortgage. Right. So this is not going to be an in depth, hey, what is a wrap? What is this up to? We're assuming you all know all that, but we will link to previous videos later on how to get there. But in a 15, maybe 17 second, what is a wrap? So a wraparound is whenever you uh, have some kind of underlying debt on a property. It doesn't matter where that debt comes from. It could be subject to, it could be your bank loan, it could be private money, I don't care. You have some kind of underlying debt on a property and then you sell it to somebody with owner financing. They become the owner of the property but you're charging them a higher principal amount and a higher interest and you're gonna charge them a higher payment than you're paying out. Right. So you should ideally be making cash flow you should ideally have some kind of principal spread and they become the owner of the house and you just get that money. So basically cash in, cash out difference you keep and that is the wrap donut. That's the wrap donut. Yes, watch episode two for that. <laughs> well, <back>. Episode. <laughs> yeah, right. Wrap donut. Hey, look there at that. So real quick, if you're watching this on YouTube, on Facebook, uh, this is live. So any questions you have, any comments you have, now is the time to address them. Um, Grant does do mentorship, but not for free. That's uh, correct. At Propelio, we don't necessarily do mentorship either. We hopefully point you in the right direction. So therefore, if you have questions, now is the time to get those addressed. Uh, so we can uh, help the class per se. Can I make that a not so subtle plug transition? I actually have a slot that is opening up next week for personal mentorship. So if anybody out there has been like considering doing the personal mentoring, I only accept students about four times a year and this next week we'll be coming up on accepting another one. So message me if you're interested in that. But this isn't a sales pitch. We're not here to sell. We wanna give you real information. And that's one of the things that guys, if you have not familiarized yourself, I know we've got a lot of new audience coming in every week, which is mm -hmm. really cool. So if you haven't familiarized yourself with Propelio and with creativecashflow.com to know that like, we have a giant stick up our butts about getting real information out to people right. for free. This kind of stuff is not going to be, hey, I'll teach you more. Like this is real information. Go back, they've got a huge catalog on at Propelio app of other videos and trainings and uh, the academy that's coming out soon and just Grant Teach Me Something episodes. Learn, learn, learn I, and I do. I will say, you know, just to keep on subtly plugging us, uh, the coolest thing we ever hear is, hey, I just did a deal and I did it from watching and learning everything of yeah. what y'all are up to. Uh, DeMarcus Carrington, he, he uh, has a deal that we're, we're helping him out with recently. Uh, and it's really cool because he's like, yeah, I just watched all your videos, come to the events, come to the masterminds, and basically everything, I, uh, you know, I'm not gonna say everything, he probably does his own. No, everything. Everything he learned is from us. So yeah. so if we have helped you out in the past, let us know. Please. Otherwise, because we're just like, what are we doing Yeah, here? that's one of the things too, and, and we'll move on, I promise. But uh, if we have helped you in some way, please let us know, comment on it, tag us, shoot us a message, because like, dude, we're just here, we're staring at cameras. We don't know what's going on on the other side of that camera. So it's super, super, super encouraging. Like I got an email last week from somebody, hey dude, I just took down my first subject too. Thank you so much for all, like that is the stuff that keeps us doing mm. this. Cause we don't charge for this. This is like a free service that we're doing because we think that this information should be accessible to everybody. So let us know if it's helping you. Right. And also let us know where you're, where you're coming from, uh, like what city, what state, and while you're watching this video, not, why not just tap in there and see where everybody else is from and that's who you need to be working with because if they're watching these videos, um, they're probably a much cooler individual than the average Joe. Uh, so drop in the comments uh, what you're looking for, what, you're, uh, what you can provide and where you're from and, and use that to help connect with other uh, people that are watching on the Propelio stream. Okay. So refinancing your wrap mortgage. So we just did our little like 30 seconds, second, <laughs> 30 seconds spiel, 30 seconds spiel about what a wrap is. But here's the challenge that you run into <clears throat> with that. So let's say, okay, remember I, I was very explicit in saying that I don't care where your debt comes from like it could be subject to debt, it could be subject to being essentially taking over on payments. It could be- Making the, payments on people's behalf. Making payments on other people's behalf. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, it could be 
that you've gotten private money to take down deals. It could be that you're uh, getting a loan from a bank to take down this deal. You have put debt on a property, so you have a loan on that, on that property. You become the owner of that property at that point in time. When you do a wraparound mortgage, you're selling the property. There is a deed, a warranty deed that goes from you or your company to another person. And that warranty deed gives them ownership. They give you a mortgage, so they're gonna be paying you nine and a half percent over 30 years, whatever, blah, 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 blah. That's the beauty about wraparounds is because they become the owner of it. It's not a, uh, it's not a rental situation. It's not rent to own. It's not any of that kind of stuff. What it is, is that person is now responsible for taxes, insurance, repairs, all that kind of stuff. Okay. That's one of the beauties. One of the challenges that you now have fallen into is that what if you have $70,000 worth of debt, on the property and you sold the house and you've got a loan to your buyer at like 115. Okay. I'm going to write that because otherwise I will forget the numbers that I've used. The 112? 115. <laughs> um, so you've got $70,000 in debt. You sell it on a wraparound. They owe you 115, which means that they probably bought it for 125, gave you $10,000 down. Um, now <clears throat> what's going to go on is you're going to go down the down and you're going to be happy and everything's awesome. And then at some point in, in time, three years from now, you're going to say, man, I've got $45,000 of equity sitting right here in this asset. Mm -hmm. Sure. Do you wish I could get that <laughs> or sure. Do you wish I could do something with, with that money? Um, another situation might be, holy crap, the do on sale clause got called on that 70. What do I do? Mm -hmm. Well, you don't own the property, so you can't go out and refinance that $70,000 because part of getting financing on a property is that you are collateralizing that loan with that asset. So it sounds like we're about to talk about something. I actually was literally just having this conversation yesterday uh, with uh, somebody on our network. I'm not gonna blast them just because I don't want them to sure. whatever. But uh, uh, this is what we're talking about. You know, hey, well, I got this equity, I got this money. I don't necessarily want to sell the note because mm -hmm. I lose the potential for further gains, right. refinance it. Right, so how can you, yeah, exactly. So how, how do, do I do that, Grant? That? So since you don't own that property, you can't collateralize the property. Mm -hmm. Any mortgage that you get, any typical financing that you're getting. So in Texas, we do a note and a deed of trust. Other places you've got the mortgage, right? Well, a note, what does a note say? When you get a note on a property, what, is that, what does that define? <laughs> Dear property, no, no, I no, love no, no. you so I, I, much. I'm sorry, people, but when you say, what does the note say? I always say, ah, 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 that stupid <laughs> song from like a year ago. What does a note say? Uh, what was the question? <laughs> what does a <the> note say? <laughs> what's in the, what, what is the point it, of a note? The note just spells out the terms uh -huh. of, of what's going on, who's doing, who, and it's just like the what, the who, the why, the when, mm -hmm. all the details of exactly. it. Exactly. And, 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 and the collateralization, all that BS. So the note is going to say, Ryan owes Wells Fargo, hundred thousand dollars at three and a half percent for 30 more years. That's the note. Right now. Let's see. I'm going to test you. How hard have you been paying attention over these last few weeks? What does the deed of trust say? The deed of trust is the, uh, isn't that the security instrument? It's the security instrument. Woo! We need to like, I'm going to invest in some confetti cannons and Daniel's, <laughs> Daniel's going to hate me because every, every week something. I'm going to hit a button. And <laughs> so yeah, it's the, uh, it's the, or you invest it and you never have to push it because Ryan's an idiot. <laughs> It's the uh, instrument for security. So what the note says is blah, 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 blah. And it says uh, that you're going to have a 30-year uh, mortgage for 3.5%, $100,000. The deed of trust is then going to turn around and say, if you don't pay that, we get, our we get to take our house back. Right. Right? It's pretty, pretty uh, self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. But in order to give them that, you have to own the house. Right. And in a wrap, you don't own the house. So you're kind of in this like, well, crud, like what do I, what do, I do? Um, so that is where a collateral assignment comes into play. That is how you're going to refinance your wraparound mortgage is through what's called a collateral assignment. Now, when, just so we make this easier for, for me, when you're saying a collateral assignment, you're using, you're not, the assignment has nothing to do with like what we do in the wholesaling world, right? Um, not really. It's yeah, same term not really. So it's different terminology. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's essentially in the technical sense of it is still essentially doing the same thing. Right. You're assigning your position in this in this security. But you're, but you're like collateralizing. 
The so, position or collateralizing another asset? Great question. So you in this, is when you do a refi, you are collateralizing your property, right? Correct. You're saying, or when you get a mortgage in the first place, you're saying as collateral, collateral being, hey, if I don't do what I say I'm gonna do, you get this from me. As collateral, I'm gonna give you this property. We don't have that property, but what we do have is a nice pretty loan with our wraparound buyer. Mm -hmm. That, in and of itself, is an asset. So, I'm, I'm hearing this, and you know, you got your bank one, I don't know, they're not around anymore. Bank of America, mm -hmm. Chase Bank, mm -hmm. your Wells Fargo's, are they, they're not gonna play typically with this. Typically, no. Yeah, typically, So you're gonna no. meet your, your local banker network person, yeah. right? If, Thank you for my, I love when I get a, a segue to a soapbox because I love soapboxes so much. You're welcome. Close your account at Chase. They don't give a crap about you. Move it over to a local community bank. Somebody that when you walk in, it feels like you're going into the set of cheers and they all turn around and they're like, Norm! Like, you need to go to a bank that actually knows who you are. Mm -hmm. um, what, I wish I could remember the Cheers theme song. It's something about knowing where you are. Um, Everyone knows your name. Yeah, that's it. Uh, go someplace like that because those are going to be the guys that are going to be helping you out with this. And even in, even in the small local community banks, not everybody's going to do a collateral assignment. But I'll, t I'll teach you a trick if you stick around here. I'll teach you a trick of how you can farm public data to figure out who's going to be able to give you this kind of loan. And then also, I also, I also, also, anyway. <laughs> Go on Facebook, get in a group, and mm -hmm. type in, "Hey, who's the boat best? Bo <laughs> I can't talk. Who's the best local bank for real estate investors and real estate investing type transactions, notes, wraps, whatever?" And you define, may define the city that you're in. Yeah, define the city because you're they in. are going to be local, right? Right, but you want to be in that local, and you want to be able to meet that bank manager, and you want to be able to have that conversation because you're not trying to pull the wool over anybody. No, you want them to you want them to be aware of what you're up to, and then also be behind that and finance that. Exactly. So with a sorry, as I refill my, you can tell I have energy today because I don't ever really drink caffeine, and like this is real coffee. So wait for my hands to start shaking. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so what you're gonna do is you're going to try to find somebody that can do that collateral assignment. That is what this is called. Now, not everybody is familiar with it. Um, there's plenty of people that are in this business, like deep dived in, like knee deep in this business and don't even know, you know what a collateral assignment is. On that, is. I think we, we've got a nugget out of this, and it's not just for refinancing the wraps. It's in terms of, when you're in this business, and whatever conversation you're having, whether it's be at the title company, a realtor, a lawyer, a banker, you need to make sure they are speaking the same language as you. Mm -hmm. Because just like a doctor, you've got the head doctor, the arm doctor, the foot doctor, the liver, you know, you have all those different languages. <laughs> so not every lawyer is gonna be able to help out with the sub twos and this and that. So that's my soapbox for a minute. Uh, yeah, I love so it. So when you are wanting to do business with something, make sure they can actually speak the language you're trying to speak. So can I can I use this as a segue into something oh that's God. off color but funny? Okay. So you talked about like there's a doctor for everybody and yeah. that you've got to speak the language. Those are great segues for me. I've got a friend from China who lives here and uh, he has changed forever what I will call a certain type of doctor because he legitimately thought that it was called a vaginacologist. Specialty doctors, no language, it's a gynecologist, but he thought it was a vaginacologist, which is actually more accurate, right? Um, okay, so anyway, so, so real estate. <laughs> I, you know what I love about that is how I just left you yeah, out Yeah, thanks in for the hanging me out to dry, buddy. Um, you're right though. So as a prime example of what you just were talking about is, I, I can't remember who it was. One of my students, I think it's down, I think they were down in Austin. Yeah, during our Q&A session, it's, uh, it's uh, well, I won't name names, but I like them a lot. They're a good mm -hmm. person. And um, they were even in Austin, they were like, or they're in Johnson County. <clears throat> and they were like, nobody around here is doing anything, uh, you know, about this stuff. Like, I went to a title company and a lawyer and a this and a that, and they do closings all day, every day, and they don't know how to do this stuff. And her interpretation of that was like, whoa, what's going on? And my response to that is like, yeah, that's why we're making such good money here, is because we're swimming upstream. There is legal ways to do this. I mean, there are a lot of illegal ways to do these things, of course, like with any investing, but there are legal ways to do that, and not every attorney knows how to do it. Not every realtor knows how to do it. Not every title company knows how to do it. So here, is my example for that. If you were to go into a Times Square with a microphone and you were to stick it in front of people's face, 
Do you think that the majority, the vast majority of people that you put that microphone in front of could tell you 95% of why Warren Buffett's portfolio has been so uh, successful? No. No, heck no. I would say 80% probably don't know who he is. <laughs> right. Do you think that the majority of people you stuck that microphone in front of could tell you 95% of what it takes to fix and flip a house? Probably. Same answer. Pro well, I think probably. Because there's enough HGTV shows. There's enough, like, they can tell you the majority of what it takes mm -hmm. to make that money in a fix and flip. They can't tell you the, the details of how to find the contractor and how to, uh, you know, drive your properties every week and these little things that make a big difference. But they could tell you 90, 95% of how a fix and flip works. Since when does your Uncle Joe that's not in this business know 90% of how a successful investing strategy works and that be the best strategy to use in a business that you're spending your Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. on an hour learning how this stuff works, right? So what I'm getting at is that when we get into these niche markets, these markets that not everybody knows how to do, yes, we have the ability to make more money in better ways with better methods than the thing that like every single guru out there in the world is like, oh yeah, let me just, anybody can do this. Anybody, you know, you take my program and you will learn how to do this too. And my, my uh, I'm do, uh, one of my mentor students yesterday had an awesome point on that. He's like, if these gurus are, are serious about anybody can do this, why don't they just hire a bunch of people and become multi-trillion billionaires? Mm -hmm. And then if anybody can do it, just outsource it. If anybody can do it, hire somebody to sit in that seat and get it done. It's not true. So you guys are doing the right thing by learning the deep in-depth uh, in details of stuff like this, the collateral assignments, that these are the things that separate us from the pack and allow us to be uber successful in this business. So, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you didn't. We're, we're um, transitioning so back So step in. one to mm -hmm. refinancing my wrap would be to identify a local bank who will do a collateral or a assignment. private lender or a private lender who will do a collateral mm -hmm. assignment. And so again, not everybody knows how that works, but the word is collateral assignment. You're going to ask, Hey, do you guys do collateral assignments? And they will say yes or no. Most of the time they won't know what's ta what you're talking about. Even like when you talk about subject two, even people in the business might not know how that works. So, so I'm going to, if you hang out is collateral and fix my spelling. Collateral assignment. assignment. And at the end of this episode, I will tell you guys how to find who's doing that. A little trick. Um, so back to, our, back to our example. We cannot collateralize this asset, this property, because we don't own it. We are not able to put that. We can't say you can take my property from me if I don't pay because it's not my property. But what we can say is that if I don't pay the money that I said I would pay you back, you can take this nice shiny asset that I have in a note, okay? So in my example I used, we said that we owe Wells Fargo $70,000 and our owner owes us, our, our wrap donut buyer owes, people that are tuning in now are gonna be like, wrap donuts, what are the, our wrap buyer that, that owes us 115. Um, you tell me, I'll try to go on a tangent for a minute. I want you guys to comment, who is in first lien position there? Is it the loan to Wells Fargo, or is it the loan uh, for seventy thousand, or is it the loan to uh, our rap buyer at one fifteen? It's the original thing in place because it was for, it was first to the altar of, you know, it was first. Yes, nothing matters in lien position Except other timing. than timing, the time and date at which it was filed. Doesn't matter that this one's for a lesser amount than that one. Uh, this one is in first lien position. So if the only thing that matters in lien position is recordation, when it was recorded, and we have a lien with Wells Fargo that was filed on January 1st, and then we have a lien with our wrap buyer that was filed February 1st, and it's now uh, March 1st, and we wanna go do a collateral assignment and get a loan to refinance out of that 70. Well, if Ryan is my private lender here, and he's gonna give me, let's just say we're just using, just purely, we're just getting that 70, just to pay them off. Well, he's gonna give me $70,000. What lien position is he in? Now he's in second. Explain. Oh, 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 oh wait, wait, wait. What, does he, is he able to, uh, when they buy that, or when they refinance that, do they also get to keep lien position? No, 
That's so a really good question. Then, then they're second. They're in second lean position. And why is that? Can you explain a little bit further? Because you're right. But it takes a step to get to second lean position. So explain why you're in second lean well, position. Well, the reason you you'd be in second lean position is because first lean was the original. Right. Second lean is you or your entity to the uh, new buyer. Right. The, the, if the, the next person coming in. Our lender, our, our private lender. Our, our private say. lender, our collateralized bank, say they only refinanced to the 50 of the, 20, of the 70. You know, they don't do the whole we're, full thing. Let's say we're gonna let's not let's not touch that topic. But let's I'm just say saying they, they would oh, be okay. they'd be third. Oh, okay. But because they're doing the full, this thing gets knocked out, this moves forward, Perfect. now they're in second. Perfect explanation. So I'm just gonna reiterate that because that was that was right on point. <laughs> that was very like like not like blocks. <laughs> and you're gonna give like the the higher level of way to of no, voice that. No, it, it was a beautiful explanation of it. It's absolutely true. We've got this loan to Wells Fargo January first. We've got this loan to our rat buyer February first. If we bring in a private lender on March first to refinance us out, well, they're getting recorded third in line. But because that refinance or that because of that lending agreement says we are going to use this money to pay off our first loan, they give us seventy or the title company 70, the title company pays off Wells Fargo. Well, now that loan is gone, okay? And so everybody skirt, moves up a spot. Mm -hmm. Now, even though that loan was originally a wrap mortgage with our buyer, now it is no longer a wrap mortgage. Now that is in first lien position. And we're not addressing the two lien, the two LLC system at this point in time. We're just talking in terms of what I'm saying here. So that now is the only debt that's on this property. The, the, the previous wrap is now the only debt on that property, which makes it first lien position. I'm sorry, it's not the only debt on the property. It's, it, was the, it was the earliest recorded debt on that property. So now that's in first lien position. So that is why we have the ability to say, okay, Mr. Lender, I really would like to pay off Wells Fargo with $70,000. Like I would really like to get that taken care of. So if you'll give me 70, I'll pay that off. And Mr. Lender's gonna go, well, psh, like hell, I'm gonna give you 70. I'm gonna be in second lien position. And why does second lien position suck? Because the reason the second lien position sucks is because, say the buyer, you have to foreclose. If, if, say first lien position forecloses on uh -huh. the whole situation. Mm -hmm. When you foreclose, you wipe out second, thirds, fours, fifths. Any subordinate else. lending gets entirely wiped away when a when a what's the difference of or the opposite of subordinate primary? When a primary loan forecloses, any subordinate lending is absolutely wiped out. They get zilch, not a nothing. Okay, that's the danger of being in a second lien position. So our sophisticated lender here is gonna say, no, I'm not gonna lend you $70,000 to pay off your first, because then there's still a second there, which is gonna make me subordinate to them. What if you foreclose on them? I'm wiped out, okay? So in your collateral assignment, you address that situation, okay? Part of, and I won't go into legal details on that, but we'll just because say- Because- We are not a lawyer. We're not lawyers, we're, we're not, not CPAs, CPAs, we're not financial planners. I'm not an agent. We're here for, fi or not financial- Entertainment. <laughs> 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 For entertainment purposes only. Uh, so what our collateral assignment says is, hey, you refinance me out. I can't put the house up as an asset because I don't own it. But what I do have as an asset is this loan for $115,000 to my rat buyer, mm -hmm. which will then be in a first lien position. So if I don't pay you your 70,000, like I said I was gonna pay you, then you get to take this note from me. Mm -hmm. It's not you get to take the house from me, it's that you get to take this note from me. And that's a cool position for them because as Ryan Linder, Mr. Private Linder Man. He just paid 70 and now he's getting a note for 115. You pay 70, get a note for 115. Your yield shoots through the roof if you're the note lender. Mm -hmm. So if you have a sophisticated lender, they are gonna be able to understand these terms and be like, okay, yeah, that's a pretty good situation. And with private lenders, you're gonna need to sit down and explain all of this and hell, Shoot them the link to this video. <laughs> and, and then, but because the, the collateralized assignment is not specifically the property, it's you and the note itself. Uh -huh. If you, the, the entity that you are, that's the middle of the wrap donut, uh -huh. if you do need to foreclose, <laughs> that does nothing to your private lender, your bank, because you still owe them right. the 70. Right. Right? Right, totally. Okay. And you do, like I said, address this situation in that collateral assignment in the event of a foreclosure. Like if I needed to foreclose on my rat buyer, I can still foreclose on them and get the property back. But because of the, the, the nature of how we're setting up this collateral assignment, it's going to survive that foreclosure. 
and then put them into that first lien position. So because I'm a real estate investor uh -huh. and I watch Grant teach me some things, and I watch Daniel on, on Mondays, I realize that time is money and other people's time is, is money and other people's time is, is great for me. Who do I hire or who do I need to talk to to draft those documents? Because I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting on Google to draft that right. stuff. Who, other than saying I have an idea of the concept and I can say collateral assignment to <laughs> right. the face. I know these fancy words. And I can, is it the bank that drafts that? <laughs> it's going it to be your lender or yeah. is it your lawyer? Like who does that? Yeah, the attorneys of your title company. Uh, like you can get doc prep if you've got an attorney that you like or a title company that you like or whoever. Doc prep's going to be done by them. So uh, your doc prep, like I would recommend like Matt Acock. Um, who we can we can tag in here in a second is a he's just a brilliant attorney. The dude knows his stuff. He's he's got uh, offices in I think Florida and here in Georgia and a couple different states. Brilliant dude. Um, uh, Scott Horn Horn and Associates also a brilliant dude. You're never going to meet anybody smarter than Scott. He's crazy all over the place, but dude knows his stuff. Those are two guys that I would trust in, implicitly on uh, doing this kind of stuff for a collateral assignment. But you got to find that person who is able to do it. Mm -hmm. That person who is willing to do that collateral assignment. Now, I have several private lenders that I've done collateral assignments with, but 2AT, even the more sophisticated of them. You know, I've got private lenders that have five, six, seven million dollars in the bank that, that are lending, and I still needed to explain what a collateral assignment was to them for them to feel comfortable with doing this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's a really cool um, way of doing things. It's a really cool way to get out of that. Now, in my example here, I just said, uh, we're just straight up refinancing for that 70. Right. That would be really useful if like a due on sale clause gets called. I was actually gonna ask that. What would be the purpose of doing this? Because um, typically a home, home loan or a, a, you know, a typical, the reason you would keep the sub two in place in the first place is because it's gonna be cheaper money than uh, private capital is right. ever gonna give you. Right. Um, so what would be the motivations and other than a due on sale clause or or maybe, you're, you know, that's all I can think of. Yeah. What, are the, what are the reasons that you would want to do that? Yeah, and uh, let me apologize to the guys asking for a whiteboard. I am an idiot and I left my laptop at home, so I can't whiteboard this for you guys. I um, asked if he wanted to get the, the real whiteboard, and he's like, no. Yeah, that's my bad. Um, so, but but it should, I mean, it's a fair, the, the concept is simple enough, right? You've got, a, you've got a first lien to Wells, you've got a second lien to your, your rat buyer, you're going to get a technically a third lien from somebody, which is going to pay this lien off, and everybody shifts up a spot. So now you have a first lien here, and a second lien with your, with your uh, lender, and if you don't pay your lender, that first lien becomes theirs. And they now have a loan on this asset for 115 in this example. You wanna grab the whiteboard? Sure. All right. Let's, you, let's do you, that. You say hi to all the people, I'm gonna, I'll get a whiteboard. Yeah, I'm gonna hey, answer. Hey, can you mute my uh, channel? Yep. Thank you. Uh, and I promise not to forget my laptop next time. See I, see, I got this fancy toy, right? This iPad Pro, and I was like, oh, I don't have to carry my laptop anymore. So I haven't been carrying my laptop with me anymore. And lo and behold, today, I'm like, ah, oh, crap, I should add it. So anyway, um, to answer the kind of the question of like the uh, um, uh, due on sale clause, you know, we, we know a due on sale clause is if you buy a house subject to, and like he mentioned, when you're buying sub two, you're going to have great terms typically. You've typically got like a three and a half, four percent interest rate that you're getting uh, on your terms with sub two. So you want to preserve that. You want to keep that lending in place because there's no way you're getting private money for that kind of, that kind of price. But one of the, the consequences that can possibly happen from sub two is the fact that they have the right to ask for the remainder of that loan to be due and payable at any point in time after that. Because the due on sale clause says, if you sell this property, we have the option, not the obligation, but the option to ask for this loan to be called due. What's if that, that if that, what's up Trey? <laughs> Our Vanna Trey here. Um, so if that happens, do you want us to move this? Is this good right here for you, Travion? Okay, um, if that happens, you, if you get that due on sale clause, there, there's a lot of things that you need. To, I mean, it's all hands on board at that point in time. You've gotta be ready to move. You've gotta be ready to fix this situation. There's other things that you can do to fix this situation. But one of your ultimate options, if you do have lending available to you, is going to be using a collateral assignment to just say, forget it. Let's just pay this guy off. Let's just pay Wells Fargo off and call it a day, okay? 
So in that case, what you're going to do is you're going to say, look, Wells Fargo just called this note due. I need to get 70 grand. Now, the, uh, the 70 grand in this example would be somewhere around six, 65 cents uh, on the LTV. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the, so if I, in this example, if we say it's 70,000 uh, divided by 115, that means, yeah, we're, we're at a 61 cent LTV. So getting a lender to agree to give us that 70,000 shouldn't be too difficult because we already have an income producing asset. And this loan is at 61% of the value of this asset that we have, i.e. the note. So going to any investor club, finding those people that have the capital and saying, hey, look, I'm in a spot, okay? Due on sale clause is getting called on a subject two loan that I have. I need to refinance out of that Wells Fargo loan. I need $70,000 to refinance out of that, but I already have it sold on a loan for 115 and the house is worth 125. So will you give me the 70 that I need to pay off Wells Fargo? And in return, as your collateral, I'll give you this, this note, which would then be a first lien position note. And hopefully you will be able to find somebody where that works for them, okay? So that is a, that's one of the, the really cool ways um, that you're able to take advantage of this situation. Um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, did you, were you able to address any questions or say hey that, to everybody? I was finishing oh. up that question on the, I, I talked about the due on sale clause the whole time. Well, so real that was... quick, just to clean house and, and appreciate everybody who's watching. Greg, thank you so much. I know you're from Florida. Jim McCullen, thanks for tuning in. Don't know where you are from, bud. Let us know where you're from. Marsha, Brandon, wow, Brandon Richards actually tuning in. It's been a while. Tang, as always, love you, buddy. Uh, Royce, Rochelle, Paul, Melissa, Paul, Evan, Jim. Uh, did you answer Jim's question here? Uh, I don't think so. No. Slightly off topic, regular old refi, not a refi wrap, but here, I'll let you read it because okay. I'm not a good reader. Slightly off topic, regular old refi, not a refi wrap, but if there's time, I may be refinancing a flip that's been on the market for 60 days, debating either dropping the price and taking a loss or refinancing and turning it into a rental. How do I best evaluate that situation? Yeah, that is, um, um, that's an answer that like really only you can ultimately come up with because you have to figure out what your portfolio and your situation looks like right now. Um, and you've got to figure out what your LTV is on, on that loan. Um, and if you have the ability to, to, to get that type of lending. I mean, there's, a, there's so many variables. That's, that's such a 30,000 foot view. And to really dive in and know all of those variables and answer that most accurately, um, Frankly, I think that that would just take away too much time from mm -hmm. from the topic that we're that we're talking about. But what you need to look at is you've got to figure out, a, can you afford? Because rentals are not what everybody thinks rentals are. Can you afford to not make money on that house even as a rental? If you need to make that cash flow on that house, I don't recommend doing it. If your cash flow, if you're the only time that you're going to make money on cash flow on a rental, and I'm getting ready for people to flame me, and then I'm going to ask you to show me your P and L. The only time that you're going to make, really make money on that cash flow of a rental is when your rental, uh, uh, um, the actual rent rate is double what you're paying on your debt. That's typically the only time that you will truly make cash flow from that deal because here's where everybody's going to flame me that's had a rental for eight months and is like, I make $500 a month. Well, wait for your air conditioning unit to go out and it will have killed your cash flow for a year and four months. Right. Okay. Especially this summer. Especially this summer. So, uh, you know, cash flow is not, if, if you can afford to just have an asset, a rental, and, and your only goal in that asset of that rental is, cool, somebody else is going to pay this thing off for me. I'm going to get some tax depreciation and hopefully be able to capitalize on some appreciation over time. Sweet, you're good to go. But if you're like, man, I really need $400 a month and like I could get it if I have this rent because it rents for $1,500 and I could get a debt for $1,100, do not do that. That is going to bite you in the butt. So um, look at your personal situation, your cash flow, see if you can afford that. What kind of lending you have available to you and, and kind of make your decisions from there. Cool. Did you answer Matt Smith's question? Maybe not. Uh, I paid a junior loan that was a 15 grand for 700 bucks, mm -hmm. a clear lien. I never fully understood how that even worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know either. Like I saw that, I didn't realize that that was a, that was a question. I thought it was more of just a or statement. Or maybe it was just a statement. Yeah, maybe, I mean, yeah. I, I paid a junior lo uh, loan that was for 15 grand for 700 bucks a month. They cleared the lien. I never under fully understood how that even worked. There's, again, there's not enough details in that 
observation yeah. for us to really even understand what happened either to help you out on that. Um, there. Uh, before we go to the whiteboard at all, uh, just to recap what we're talking about, we're talking about refinancing uh, your, your wraps. Step one is to identify a private lender, mm -hmm. identify a local community bank that will collateralize your assignment. Step two is reach out to or find a lawyer, an attorney, or a title company who can draft those documents yes. who speaks the language of wraps, investing, whatnot. Um, step three would be what? Close and make your money, honey. Close. So it's a it's a, so what I'm hearing is it's a pretty straightforward concept. It's a pretty straightforward con concept, concept, yeah. Uh, but a lot of people don't know you could do exactly. that. Exactly. It's really straightforward. It's just a niche. It's right. just that not people, not many people. I love Daniel's, I love Daniel's uh, phrase here, and I'm going to steal this, Daniel. I hope that you understand that. Uh, cash flow in a rental is just escrow for repairs. <laughs> That's perfect. Okay, so let's draw some pictures. How about that? We got some pictures. All right, so. Those don't work very well. These don't work very well? Okay. Yeah. Here's your blue one. Good to know. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at our lean positions. First of all, we're going to draw us some nice pictures, okay? So over here, we've got us a house. That's my message to everybody today. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> I like the little heart. I know. We've got us a house that we want to buy as an investor, okay? So what we're going to do, um, what's the best way that I want to look at this first? If you we're said do you, had, you, you said you had a 70 and then a 115. That's the example we were using. Actually, could you write that over there? Because I'm going to kind of use these, these spaces on this to, to draw this out. No one's watching anymore anyway. <laughs> we have a lot of people I'm watching. Um, so for this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use... Um, I guess it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to say debt on the property, okay? So we want to buy this house, okay? So we are the investor, and we are happy because we're buying this house. So we get a deed when we buy that house, right? That, that gives us ownership of the property. Now, in order for us to have gotten that deed to the property, what we had to do and I'm going to put this in, in red because this is money out, okay? So we're saying this is money out, which is debt. We had to take out a loan to a bank because this is what banks look like, apparently. We have to take out debt to a bank, and we're going to say that we're going to owe them 70 grand. Okay? Now, part of how that works when we have that debt on that, is we now have a lien position. And I'm not gonna bother putting deed of trust and note on here, but what I'm gonna put is I'm gonna put a date. I'm gonna say that this is filed 1-1 one, one of 18, whatever. Okay, so this is our first lien. Now, what we're then going to do is we're going to wrap that debt. Now we have an episode about wraparounds earlier on in the grant teach me something. So go, I think it's like a, within the first 10 or so we do wraparounds. But just for visual sake, what we're then going to do is we're going to sell this property to a nice happy family that wants to own a house, okay? Now these guys, are going to be sold, they're happy, they're gonna be sold this loan, or this house, for 115, okay? And this lien is going to be filed to one of 18, and it's going to be a second lien. And, and just to recap, just, just to really bang it in everybody's head, the reason this is first is because it's January 1, the reason this is second, is because this is February 1. The lien position is solely based off of the date, not the amount. Not the amount. So when we do this, we now no longer have deed to the property. We are transferring that deed over to our new buyers, okay? So they have the ownership of the property. They have a lien for 115. They filed it February 1st. Now. We get into a position where, hey, oh man, we need to pay off this bank for, for in, whatever in that, reason. It could be because, it, it doesn't matter. It's 
do on sale clause, maybe the bank's going under, whatever. Well, and I'll just go ahead and address this now because this will uh, this was going to be the next topic I was going to go into and we can just combine efforts. Um, we've been talking about, hey, we just want to pay them off for the 70. One of the other great parts about a collateral assignment is what if we just need 10 or $20,000? Well, maybe we get a collateral assignment, we get a lien from our investor for 90. We use 20 to pay them off. We cash out nine or 20, or I'm sorry, we use 70 to pay them off. We cash out 20. That is essentially a cash out refi. That, yeah. So that would be the other, like when we're talking about doing these collateral assignments, we've been talking about just, let's just pay them off. But you can get a loan from your lender for a little bit more than your payoff and keep some cash, mm -hmm. okay? So anyway, we're getting into a situation where we need to pay them off, uh, do on sale, whatever the, that reason might be. So we're gonna go talk to our lender. Do we have another color other than green and red and blue? Black, cool. We're gonna go talk to our lender and we're gonna say, okay, private lender. Um, I need a collateralized assignment. Yes. So I'm gonna put here, call, collateral assignment from our lender because I, don't, I, I, can't, I can't spell good. Really, I just don't have the space. So we need a collateral assignment to come in from our lender. Well, we cannot say, hey, lender, if I don't pay you, I'll give you the house because we don't own the house. Who owns the house? The family. The family owns the house. They owe us 115 for that house. We owe the bank 70. We're gonna say, hey, lender, I need 70,000. Will you give that to me? Lender's gonna say, okay, cool. I'll give that to you. So they're gonna give us 70,000 and we're gonna file this 3118, and that puts them in third lien. Okay, space is difficult here, so bear with me. So we've got a first lien, January 1st, second lien, February 1st, third lien, March 1st. Well, as part of this whole transaction, when it gets closed, whoosh, we are paying off the bank. So that first lien goes away and now all of a sudden the second lien becomes a first lien and that third lien becomes a second lien. All right, you follow? <laughs> so now what we have, this is gone. These guys still own the house. They still owe us 115. But instead of out of that 115 us paying the bank 70, we're paying our investor 70. So I don't have this question, but I'm sure somebody has this question. Okay. How does any of this affect these guys? They don't see anything. Right. These guys don't see anything from this situation. And they, they you don't may need have to get an allonge signed from them oh. that says like, yes, I have a mortgage for this amount. But that's May. You don't necessarily have to do that. That's just kind of depending on your closing agent on whether or mm -hmm. not they're going to have to have that. Other than that, this all happens in the background with us dealing with it. So just to put it in donut form. Yes. Because we like donut form. Yes. Hopefully everybody got this. Uh, let's go here because we like donuts. I do like donuts. You know, I've been having a donut every morning for this past like three weeks. You can see it. You can see it. So that's the original, the 70. Then this is that, the 115. And so the refi would be to knock this guy out. Mm -hmm. But what, what you were saying, which I found interesting, is you don't only have to do that for 70. You could actually. Oh, that's a good illustration. You yeah. know, do it like that. And now you have this. And then you take out your, your 10 or your, your, your 10 to 20 or whatever mm -hmm. to have cash in your pocket to. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, boost your business. Right, exactly. So if you need some operating capital, you get with somebody who's willing to lend you a little bit more than your payoff, that'll give you some operating capital and you're preserving your lien. <laughs> you're preserving your note that's here. So, so if I may, just because again, I had this conversation yesterday, I might as well whiteboard it. Sure. Um, Cause it is a wrap. So you've got a, a 120 sub two. Then they actually put 45 into it for repairs. And then they put, and then they sold it for, let's just say 190. Okay. Um, you know, that's the, that's the, 
So they're in the with a 165 basis? Yeah, so they're, they're in it for 165. Okay. Um, I, I don't know percentages or anything like that, uh -huh. but I just know, yeah, they're in it for 165. Uh, you know, 165 on a 190, you know, that's still, you can still make money on the, the everything, but you couldn't necessarily sell the note right. because you're giving up too much. Yeah, exactly. So if you were to sell that note, a 190 note, uh, let's assume that it has been seasoned for at, at, at least, a, well, let me say it this way. Uh, my minimum offer that I can typically get people on a note sale if it's been seasoned for six months or so, it's about 87%. Right. In that case, we would be making an offer of 165 three. So you're making 300 bucks from right. selling that note, right? Now I can make, if it's been seasoned longer, I can make offers up to like 93, 95%, depends on, depends. I, I, I can even get 100% if it's been seasoned for a long time. It just, if you've, got, all I'm saying is, you've got a note for sale, let me know, we can, we can take a bid on it. But if they uh, uh, are in this situation, why are they trying to, why are they trying to get out? They're not trying to get out. Okay. They're just trying to, Get, get some capital to go on to the next venture. Gotcha. They're trying to do what we were talking about before. We're like, hey, why not get 10 to 20 hours? Yeah, so this is gonna be a challenging situation for that because you don't have the LTV numbers to back everything up, mm -hmm. right? When you get somebody involved on a collateral assignment, they need their, their loan to be protected. And that protection method comes through LTVs. Last week, actually, wasn't it last week that we were talking about um, benefits of, of owner financing. I think it was last week, we were talking about why we can buy at 95% with owner financing and it'd be okay. Well, right. it's because we're not putting cash out on the table. But now, if we're putting cash out on the table, then we need that money protected by a loan to value percentage that makes sense. Mm -hmm. What we would be asking a bank or a lender to do is put $165,000 of actual cash on the table. Therefore, now LTV requirements are going to kick in. Which is usually what? Which 80%? is usually 70 or 75%. Oh. Um, now, if you are a little bit more established, like my lenders will typically lend me up to 82, maybe even 85%, depending on the deal, because I'm established in the business. Like right. people know that it's a safe bet. But if you're not super established, you're, not, you're probably not getting that. You're probably getting 70% is, is, the, is the average of the value of the property. So if this house is worth 190, the most that you would hope to get on that kind of deal, oops, would be like 130. 140 mm -hmm. maybe. So you can't really cash out on this. Um, you might be able to sell a partial note to somebody to, to get some cash on this, but really this doesn't have enough spread and equity to make anything work with like refinances or note sales or that kind of stuff, unless this was seasoned for a serious amount of time where I might be able to get somebody um, maybe like like ten or fifteen thousand dollars to walk away with if it's been seasoned but for a couple of years. But that's to walk away. That's that's to sell. That's it. selling the yeah. note. So this one, this scenario, the re, the refi is just it's just not going to work. Right, right. But I mean, you can still make money. Still making money. Well, there's great cash flow here, right? I'm sure there's great cash cash flow here right. because they're probably on sub two, you know, at four percent. These repairs, I wonder what their terms are that they got those repairs. No I don't yeah. know, but you know, it's probably less than nine and a half percent, which is what you should be nine and a half, ten percent charging on this 190. So they're probably cash flowing a few hundred dollars. Yeah. But that's a good even deal. Though they, even though they got 45 in it, yeah. they're, I mean, 45 at a bank is what? Negative 5%? Yeah. And that wouldn't be, uh, that, that deal wouldn't necessarily meet my, my minimum standards on uh, uh, rules of thumb, but it still makes you money. So that's how collateral assignments are going to work. And, and, and again, the cool thing here is that you can do essentially a cash out refi or just a straight up refi through these collateral assignments. Um, and those can be great ways to get out. So I think, that we've, I think that we've pretty well explained what this method is for people. And we can just jump, kind of jump into questions before, mm -hmm. we, uh, before we start closing out. Yeah, so if you have scenarios where you're in a sub two deal or you're in a wrap deal, and you are trying to figure out, is this, <coughs> am I capable of refinancing that? Uh, send us some details. Uh, if you would rather not, uh, you know, blast it out there, throw me a DM and I may or may not see it. But uh, just drop in the comments, that's the easiest way for us to, to get that addressed. What is a good IV position, do you know? Income to value position, I guess, maybe? That's hey, probably. Jaime, what's the, what's the IV? I'm, I'm not familiar with that. And I'm not sure, I'm trying to, I'm trying to address Jaime's question, but I don't really get it. I'm going to read it out loud. Maybe that helps. Since that investor likes a note for cash flow, but maybe not likes that second position, could you substitute collateral and give him a $70,000 note that's in first position 
in a good IV position, which I'm not sure what IV is, on another asset. You bought this new $70,000 note for 40, yeah, in, oh, investment to value. N bought this new $70,000 note for $40,000. Dude, I'm sorry, I'm not following you. It, it might just be, um, it might just be performance anxiety because I'm in front of the camera, but I just am not, and I'm just not following that. Well, question. let's, let's uh, answer a question from Megan okay. on uh, YouTube. Uh, thank you, Megan, for first of all actually having a name on YouTube and not one, two, three, bucket rust. <laughs> Crux killer fourteen. Yeah. Uh, what if I uh, only want to take some of the rust. equity, like for another investment? What are those pros and what are those cons? Well, I mean, that's exactly what we were just talking about, right? So if you look at, um, if you look at, uh, uh, like in this example, all right, we've got a seventy thousand dollar underlying mortgage with a hundred and fifteen thousand dollar wrap. Well, maybe if we've got a hundred and fifteen thousand dollar wrap, that means that we could we could probably uh, do a substitute or a uh, um, collateral assignment, and maybe get about eighty five thousand dollars for a collateral assignment, depending on your lender. I ran that at about 75 cents, so it depends on your lender if you're 70 cents or 80 cents LTVs. But let's say that you could get a collateral assignment for 85,000. Well, that's a $15,000 bump in your uh, uh, equity, or I'm sorry, in your cash position. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's, run some, let's run some numbers again here. Let's just kind of take, let's take a real life, let's whiteboard this. Let's take a real life mm -hmm. example on this. Um, Trey, I'm gonna move the whiteboard over a little bit so the fan is not like killing the mic. Oh, cool. That's what I was trying to. Okay. Are we still good on camera? Uh, so what we're gonna do I, here I is- I like to give Trey a, keep him active on his toes. <laughs> That's what happens when you got good good crew is that you can handle stuff like that. So you want to write these because your handwriting is much better than mine. <laughs> that, that's that's a disaster. If um, mine is better. Okay, it, what we yeah. got? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna run like a semi real life scenario. We're gonna run what this might look like in real life with those numbers that I gave. So look, let's say that we've got a seventy thousand dollar. Hold on, I gotta get my hashtag. Hashtag wrap donut. I will be very excited in 20 years when people <laughs> think that the wrap donut is an actual it was mine. thing. Mine, me. <laughs> anyway, what is it? Seventy thousand. Um, so go ahead and write this over there. Uh, we're going to do a seventy thousand dollar underlying mortgage. Is that the first? This is the first lien. We're going to do it at four and a half percent, and we're going to say that that one had 27 years left on it. That's a kind of average deal. That would mean that our principal and interest on that loan is going to be 37360. So let's just round up and say 375. Just for the sake of ease here. Supposed to PI. Our PI. Our P and I. So on this loan that we're taking over subject to for $70,000, we have a P and I payment of 3, 375. 375. Mhm. Mm now, what we have said is that we sold that house for maybe 125 and took a $10,000 down payment. Therefore, we've got a 115. Oh, so on a second lien, we've got a 115 loan at nine and a half percent for 30 years. And the loan payment coming in is gonna be 366.98, I'm sorry, 966.98. So let's say uh, 960 or 970, just for, just for sake of ease here. So we are now cash flowing 970 minus 375. On this asset, we would have been typically cash flowing $595 a month. Mm -hmm. Real quick, just because my head is stuck on the wrapped donuts, it, there's actually two donuts in this situation. You've got the 27 year donut. You'll be eating this for 27 years, which is that four and a half percent, right? Yeah. And then this one is the nine and a half percent. So you're doing this one for 27 years and for three years, you don't get a donut at all. You get that donut hoe. Oh shoot! And that's for hashtag donut holes. <laughs> hashtag, hashtag wrap donut holes. <laughs> so, but but you know that that's but people need to realize that because that's yeah. the power of this mm -hmm. is you're not just capturing the the five percent uh, on on twenty seven years. You're you're capturing the five percent. Um, you know whatever that is here to here five percent. 
for 27 years, but for three years, you're getting a full nine and a half percent. Right. And you know, that, that adds up. It does, it really does. So uh, and again, I encourage you to watch our wraparound video because that's, that's gonna the, explain this stuff in full. That's the donut hoe. Donut hoe. <laughs> Um, so basically like what he's saying is that for 27 years, you're going to make $595 a month. And then for three years, you're going to make $970 there it a is. month. It's the hashtag OF donut hole. <laughs> <laughs> so it's free content guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, all right. So let's get rid of these because we're going to, we're going to, I'm sorry, buddy. We're getting rid of this beautiful picture here because we're going to no, keep but writing it, on it. I, we're joking, but that is a serious uh, thing. It's a thing. big benefit here. Yeah. But most okay. people don't realize it. Um, so let's look at the situation now. Well, we would have been cash flowing. Let's kind of do like a wah, wah. We would be cash flowing $595 a month from the difference there. Now, now you're in the situation where you want to do a collateral assignment. And so what you want to do is you want to get rid of that 70 grand that's here. So you're going to bring in a private investor to cash you out. Now in this example, you're saying how much, how much working capital can I get from this? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, with this LTV requirement, you would probably be able to get a collateral assignment somewhere in the $85,000 range. So, so we're going to say, we're going to get a collateral assignment for 85,000. Now, First and foremost, that gives us 15 grand of cash in our pocket. What we're doing is we are taking money out of our equity position. We are taking from our owner financed piggy bank. Mm -hmm. we, are cap we are going ahead and grabbing that cash out of there. So we will no longer be making our 5% uh, our uh, our spread of interest on that $15,000 or actually that $15,000, I take that back. That was at the, that was the outer rim of the donut. Right. We were making nine and a half percent interest on that $15,000 before. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want you to fully understand the consequence of cashing out in this way is that, Hey, if we do a loan for 85 grand, we're going to pay off 70 and we are stealing from our piggy bank that we used to have this $45,000 equity in. Now we'll only have $30,000 of equity. Well, remember, that equity that we used to have was making nine and a half percent. So we've pulled 15 out of that. We will no longer be making interest on it. Will we be, I, I, I know your, your language and your handwriting skills are bad. Will we be able, can you figure out how much opportunity lost? Yes. An amount that you can actually show? Yes. So what we would, well, actually that would be, that'll be pretty easy for me to do. Let me just do that real quick. Yeah, um, and, and just, just to dumb it down for people like myself, what he's saying is, yes, you can get, you can steal. It's not stealing. You're, you're taking out the 15,000, but that 15,000 now could mean, oh, by the way, you're not going to make 22 later. 45. 45,000. If you are to take out this 15 now, you are passing up on a total income of $45,000 over the time. One thing we never talked about is what interest rate these are typically That's at. where I'm going. Yeah. yeah that's, my bad. Well, no, 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 no. That's, the, um, that's a great segue because that's exactly what we're talking about is what is the effect of taking out a collateral assignment? Because you're not getting it at four and a half percent. That's not going to happen. You're with private money now. You're with investor terms now. It's going to be more. Mm -hmm. But one of the effects of that is you're grabbing 15 grand that you were making nine and a half percent on for the next 30 years. You're essentially losing out on, on $30,000 of interest carry that you would have made on that. Um, so, so what I'm hearing is if you can never, ever, ever, ever have to get a collateral assignment, don't do it. You're in a better position because this first lien position, a four and a half percent, it's very unlikely that you're going to find a bank or a, a private money guy or gal to give you four and a half percent. Is that what I'm saying? Very unlikely. What you're, what you're saying? Yeah. Not going to okay. happen. The least in today's market with low interest rates, the least that you can expect to get out of that if you have excellent credit, a wonderful relationship with your bank, all that blah, 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 somewhere in that six and a half to seven percent range. So just to recap this whole video, this whole scenario is if there's a due on sale clause, there's a disaster and you have to do something and you don't have $70,000 sitting in your bank ready to apply to this. Right you can still cash flow, you can still make money, mm -hmm. uh, and you can get out of this, the bad situation of, oh crap, shit's right. hitting the fan or the right. ceiling. But if you can do it without doing this, you should do that. You should. Got it. So let's look at what this most likely is going to look like. Most likely your collateral assignment is gonna be somewhere like nine and a half percent for 
for 20 years maximum. Lots of times that private lenders will only go 10 years. Lots of times they will only go less, right? But let's say that you've got terms that you're able to get, like what I, like my private money that I get, I'm paying nine and a half, nine percent, eight, somewhere between eight to nine and a half. Somewhere between like, like most of my lenders are at eight, but we're going conservative and we're saying up to nine and a half because I've got one of them that does that. 20 year terms. If we do $85,000 at nine and a half percent for 20 years, that means that we are paying out $790 a month. So now we are replacing our debt that used to be 375 a month with debt that's now 790 a month. And we are going from a $595 cash flow a month to a $220 cash flow a month. This collateral assignment saved our rear in that due on sale clause. So it's okay to make 220 a month because you were about to be making a whole lot of zero a month. <laughs> Was that math not right? <laughs> 790, ah, 120 a month. So it's okay to be making 120 a month because you were about to be making, <laughs> is that still, I'm, I'm, hold on, 790, 180. I was almost there. <laughs> so let me say it again. It's okay to be making 180 a month because you were about to be making a whole lot of nothing a month if that went through. Um, collateral assignments can work in that way. Well, another way that a collateral assignment can work is what if your underlying mortgage has a balloon on it mm -hmm. and you need to get out? Right. There are reasons why it makes sense to do a collateral assignment. There are reasons, but understand the consequence of what's happening there. So not only are you taking out that cash that you could have made, but you're getting less cash flow going forward if you were to do that higher end uh, refi. But to be clear though, it's, you know, if that's only 20 years and this is still 30 years, you're still going to get 10 years of that 970. Yeah. So in this case, let's uh, let me uh, uh, do math. Yeah. Do a do fill some time for me for five <laughs> seconds so I can do some math and give you guys some answers. Well, let's see what people are saying. So we know. Oh, cool. We still have people watching. Yay. Hashtag you guys are awesome. Thank you, Sonia. Um, let me see. Let's see. Wrap donut holes. Really? Yes, Dan. That's what we play. Uh, that's what we do here. Um, <clears throat> I have a deal looking to sell. This may be a better option. Possibly. Uh, thanks, ooh, but, but thank ooh, you so, so much for watching, Evan. Uh, Matt Smith, can you explain how junior loans are paid off? Yeah, that's through the title company. Yeah, through title company. Mark, thanks for watching. Um, can you explain how junior loans get paid off during foreclosure? I've heard of second position loans getting paid for 500 bucks, even if the loan is second position for 10 grand. Um, let's, let's skip circle back to that at the end. Uh, well, I think Daniel's already, yeah, Daniel's already responded to that with a short. Um, let me see if anybody on YouTube's. So at the end of this video, we will be doing like a book giveaway for the random comment picker. So make sure you're getting comments in. Uh, it's not a one, it's a one to one ratio. So if you do 10 comments, you're getting 10 opportunities to win a book. Uh, same thing on YouTube, but not the YouTube chat. It's the YouTube comments. So later in the day, throughout the day, if you want to go to the YouTube video of right now, but later, uh, drop comments in and I don't know, five, six, later today, I'll do a, a, a random comment picker from those comments, uh, but it's not in the live chat that y'all are in right now. It's once this video is done, then you can ask comments and drop in comments there and we'll do a, a book giveaway from those as well. So therefore, all you Facebook people, after the video, head over to the YouTube video and drop comments because uh, we like to give stuff away. As far as what we got going on, uh, August 14th in DFW, we have our DFW Real Estate Investor Meetup in Grapevine. If you are in three to five hours driving range and you haven't been to this meetup, you need to come out. Uh, we've got anywhere from four to 600 people come out, free booze. Uh, we've got the Crown, we got the Scotch, we got all the stuff. We got free Chick-fil-A, a lot Ooh. of networking opportunities, a lot of opportunities to learn. It's probably, if you've been to local events, this is not it. If you, this is the first event you've ever been to, I'm sorry, because other events are not like that. Uh, August 20th, we'll be in San Antonio with the same event. So if you're in San Antonio, check us out on August 20th. Um, and that's what we got here. As far as Propelio, what we do and actually how we make money, uh, we do subscription set base uh, uh, for real estate investors where we offer you, uh-oh, whoops. 
<laughs> we offer you access to, uh, to off-market leads. Uh, we get you access to uh, true MLS comps, and we also give you access to have an investor-friendly website. And on Aug October 1st, we're releasing the Propelio Academy, where all this stuff and the kitchen sink we are giving to you for free. So Grant, you ready? Yep. Cool. So I ran some quick numbers so that y'all can see just the, not, I'm not showing you the process that I ran, I'm just showing you the, the end story here. Your wrap, your wrap donut, it, for the 30 year, nine and a half, 115, that would make you an income of $348,000 over that next 30 years. And, and, and that's even with the 70 getting paid off. That is just purely only looking at principal and interest over 30 years on nine and a half percent, 115. That is only, this is the money that your buyer will pay you. Got okay? it, got it. The money that your buyer will eventually end up paying you is $348,000. If, you have this $70,000 underlying mortgage. And this is the 27 year? That's the 27 year underlying mortgage. Over the 27 years at four and a half percent and you know, whatever we, the terms right. are that we put there, four and a half percent, 27 years, $70,000, you will pay out 121,000. So if you were to leave this situation alone and not do a collateral assignment, you will make $227,000 total from this deal. Okay. Which is more than what, what, yeah. little. So 227,000 from this deal. And that's not even counting your down payment that you got when you wrapped this, which was probably another 10 or $15,000 on top of that. Right. If you do a collateral assignment and cash yourself out and you've got a loan here of $85,000, total the money that you will pay on that loan over the 20 year term at nine and a half percent is going to be one hundred and ninety thousand dollars so on this situation this is gonna be less <laughs> it's gonna be less it'd be 348 minus 190 you will make one hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars in that spread plus the $15,000 that you get from cashing out plus your down payment. Okay. So more apples to apples, we would add 15 to this and that'd be 160, 172, 173. Right. So more apples to apples, you're making 173 here and 227 can, there. Can we do one with just the 70 and not the, uh, um, oh, this is what this was. No. Yeah. Can we do one with the 70 refi and not 85 yeah, refi? Absolutely. Because so just this, this for, example is just so we can get money out of the bank. Exactly. So just for this example right here, apples to apples, you're losing $55,000 by doing that loan. Now, if we were to just refi the 70 at 9.5%, 20 years, your total that you will pay is gonna be $157,000. And what's that minus 227? So 227 minus 157, Wait, 227 minus 157? Uh, the 348. 348. Sorry. 348 minus 157. You're making $191,000 there. So. 191? $191,000. So you're essentially getting out $30,000 less in just doing a pure collateral assignment on the principal balance right. alone. You're getting about $55,000 less by cashing out right now versus if you were to just leave it alone as what, is. What do we say the difference that was? Uh, 30, 30, yeah. 30 ish. All right, so for all you economics people, the opportunity cost. 36, I'm sorry, 36. The opportunity cost of actually doing a refi is $36,000. You, you're losing the opportunity cost to do this, uh, that's probably wrong terminology, but anyway, you're, you're losing $36,000 to have the peace of mind that you got this covered and you're, you're good to go and you refied. Obviously, if you don't have to refi, you're making the most money. The opportunity cost to actually pull that 15 out is uh, $55,000. So you gotta think, with the fi uh, whatever, what's the difference between 36 and 55? About 20. So 19. it's costing you 20 and change, um, $22,000 maybe, whatever, 20. Yeah. It's costing you $20,000 to pull out 15 out. So you gotta think, Versus okay, what what's that? 
versus the other option of just pulling the 70. Yeah, so you can just pull 70 and and get your 191, but if you do have to take that uh, 80 to get your 15 now, mm -hmm. It's going to cost you about twenty grand to do that. Now, and again, just to close up on this, what we want to five grand. What we want to make sure that you understand, though, is you may hear that and be like, "Well, then I'm just never going to do a collateral assignment." Well, you are losing thirty-six or fifty-five thousand dollars by doing this. But what if this loan is getting called in a balloon or a due on sale or something like that? You are gaining one hundred ninety-one thousand dollars or right. one hundred fifty-eight thousand dollars by doing it this way, because otherwise you're getting squat. Because it's it's killing you. Yeah. You're foreclosing. You're, and you're yeah, out. either getting foreclosed on, or you got to come out of your piggy bank with seventy grand. Right. And then the opportunity costs your money not going towards other stuff. Absolutely. Cool. Let's let's address a lot. Any other questions? And let's get out of this thing. All right. What do we got here? Well, what's we got? Questions. Um. I just like the comment of you guys are awesome. Oh. Let's just reread awesome. that over and over. Thank you, Sonia. Great info. Greg's like bragging that he got a book. Cool. Uh, this was a lot of info. So thankful I can play it back later. Great yeah. time. Well, absolutely. Thanks, Lucretia, for watching. Uh, like drinking from a fire hose, I'll have to press rewind one time for my mind. That's how, how we teach one. here. You know, but that's, you know, I'm glad you wrote that. Uh, wrote that. I'm glad. Is that right? Yeah, you're right. I'm glad you wrote that, Jeff, uh, because, again, that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, what we do here is not give you high level things that you have to Google later. We hope that the videos that we're providing you, all the information's there, and if it's not there, can at least be addressed in the comment section. So if you're watching this a year from now, and you're like, wow, Ryan and, uh, and Grant, or Grant and Ryan didn't really answer my question, I challenge you to drop a comment below, tag myself, tag Grant, tag Propelio, tag uh, Daniel, um, and I, I bet you a dollar it'll get answered. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I love you guys being here and, and, and watching this. So, um, yeah, I think that, that I think we've addressed it as, as I'm looking through. I think we've addressed our questions here. So, guys, again, like he said, you know, I'm really big on real actionable information. This is not stuff that you can just get from anybody. We are not the gurus just like, yeah, anybody can do it. Everything's easy. Yeah, just pay me $9.97. Um, that said, <laughs> if you do want some more education on how owner financing works, on how some of these creative strategies work. I do have creativecashflow.com. We have partnered up with Propelio to get you this kind of information uh, on a weekly basis. And then I do have an academy that whereas like right here, we're just kind of shotgunning ideas and getting, my academy teaches you from start to finish everything that needs to happen. We've got a weekly Q and A session live that I stream from my living room at the house where I answer everybody's questions that are coming through that want to know something that might not be mentioned in an in a academy lesson or might not be mentioned here, we are able to dive a little bit more deeply in there. Like I mentioned earlier, I do have a slot open for a personal mentor. So uh, that's starting next week. If you are interested in having a personal mentor, let me know, message me, we can go from there. The way that that works is we'll go to coffee, we'll interview each other, see if it's a good fit for both of us because I don't accept everybody in and I don't think that you should fork over that much money for somebody that you don't think can get you where you want to go. But let's go from there and see if that works. And Alex, uh, great question. Are events 21 and up or 18 and up? Honestly, our events are, are you an entrepreneur and want to do some, do some things? Um, shout out to a couple people. Jalen Wilson, he's still in high school, and he actually quit football to pursue uh, real estate. Freaking awesome. He comes to our events. He comes to our masterminds. He's active on the videos. He absorbs it. Um, and he actually asked a, a, a question the other day, which was, you know, I'm waiting until I'm, I'm 18. I'm waiting to graduate before I do my first deal. And everybody he meets is like, why? You know, find yourself a JV partner to sign on the, the mm -hmm. you know, just because you're, you're not 18 and can't sign a contract doesn't mean you can't do deals. You just got to get people in your corner that you trust to help you out. So uh, I would encourage anybody at any age to get in this business. Um, another shout out is we have a, a group of kids. They're called Go Kids Pro uh, who actually sponsor our events and they're young entrepreneurs who are I don't know how old they are. I just know I don't talk to them unless there's an adult in the room. That's how young they are. Uh, probably 12 and 14, maybe 10. I don't know. They're just young. Um, but my point to address that is the fact that they're <laughs> – shut up. I, they're young. <laughs> I, you know. What a terrible example of how young somebody is. <laughs> like, We're just going to let that one go. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> no, I'm just saying is it, 
being an entrepreneur does not, it doesn't matter if you're 12, you're 14, you're 18, yeah. or you're 62. Um, same thing for the, for the older folk who've had a job for 20 years, 40 years, and they're like, I want to do real estate. Well then, by God, do it. Mm -hmm. um, don't let age hold you back. That's there what is I'm, no that's try, my rah -rah. there is only do. That's my rah-rah. So hopefully that answered your question. Uh, what else we got here? Um, that's everything that I see. I'm glad nobody else has addressed that, so we'll just get out of here before somebody does <laughs> address for that. Here, guys. Don't <laughs> yeah. forget, every Wednesday we're here. Every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Please tag somebody. If you think that somebody could get use out of this, tag them. Tag them in the comments so that they can come in here and watch this, share it to a group, whatever that might be. We're here to spread love. We're here to spread knowledge. We're not, we're, it's an it's a, uh, abundance mentality. So let's work together to make sure that the entire investing landscape is brought up together. That's your buddy, right? Hi, me. Yeah. So what book do you want to give away? Um, let's do Rocket Fuel. It's the follow-up to Traction, and uh, it's quite good. I haven't well. heard that one. Yeah. Rocket, Rocket Fuel. Fuel. Rocket Fuel. All right. It describes the so. uh, relationship between a visionary and an integrator, which are the two major roles that are needed in any company, which you may not realize are there. So, uh, yeah, it's a really good book. So, Jaime, if you would, send me a DM uh, with your address and your phone number or whatnot, and I'll get that book off to you. Uh, again, everybody that's watching on YouTube, everybody watching on Facebook, if you would like to be in a, uh, a book giveaway contest, go to the YouTube video um, after we get off here, I'll drop a link in the uh, uh, comment section just so you can have it. Uh, just because I love to spend Daniel's money. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you, Mark. I try to be funny. Um, so go there after we finish this. It may take a few minutes for it to kick in uh, to allow the comments. Uh, but we'll be doing a random comment picker on YouTube later this afternoon uh, to give a book away from there. Uh, only because we like to give shit away. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you so much for watching. If you have questions in the future, if you have ideas for, for what content you want to see, whether it be from Daniel, myself, or Grant, all you got to do is tag us and say, hey, I want to see more of this. If you have questions pertaining to this subject matter or you need recommendations, I did see a comment. Uh, do you have any plugs for any local bankers in the DFW? Yeah, in DFW, use Texas Republic Bank or, oh, I didn't give you my trick, Texas Republic Bank or Texas Brand Bank. Here's the trick to finding, uh, finding who will do a collateral assignment. Go search your local county clerk, which can be done online, and there is a document type called collateral assignment. So look for collateral assignments that are being recorded. Look for the lenders that are working on those collateral assignments and reach out to them and say, mm -hmm. this is what you want to do. So that's your trick. That's how you find lenders. That and and then as this. far as, is there a market rate people should be looking for? You said um, nine and a half. Yeah. I mean, like I get, so like I said, I'm getting anywhere from eight to nine and a half percent, maximum 20 years. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm at. But again, I'm established, I'm less of a risk, so I don't know what you would be getting. Your job is to back yourself into the deal and see what makes sense. If you're in a situation where you need this, anything is better than nothing. And let me also be very clear too, here's a, I know we've been dismounting for a second, but let me just say, if you're in a situation where you're getting a due on sale clause or a, a balloon or something like that, even if you're not going to be making money on this deal, it is the right thing to do to get that collateral assignment so that your family that bought this house from you is not getting kicked out of their home, mm -hmm. okay? So even if the terms don't make you any money, I'm sorry, that's part of the deal. That's part of the risk that you took when you got in here. One of the, one of the things that I put in every one of our mission statements of every company that I own is that we're gonna do the right thing, especially when it's not in our favor. So yeah. this would be one of those situations. And the situation he's talking about is you're in the wrap, Obviously, you've, you've made the documentation to where you're in the clear no matter what, but if for whatever reason, uh, you know, do on sale clause, and you're like, well, I, whatever, I'll just let it foreclose, and you're screwing over the, 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 end, the, buyer. the end buyer. Your rap buyer. Um, don't do that. And that do just goes, right back, you know, goes back to what we say a lot here, which is don't be a dick. Uh, you know, and if you're getting into a real estate with the intentions like that, <clears throat> You know, don't come to my events, don't come to our events, don't do business with me, right. and then let people know that you're an asshole so they know not to do business with you. Um, Especially if it's after like 7.30 or so. <laughs> Basically, just because you're in real estate is not a, a, you know, you need to have 
you need to have ethics, you need to have morals, and you need to be a good person. You can still make a ton of money in, 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 right in situations and still make it a win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not trying to be on a high horse and be like, oh! But it's our know. job. It's our job as people that are in front of a camera and your job as people that are doing this business. It's our job to reinvent the real estate investing world. And, uh, and, and we do that by doing things honorably. So even if you're not gonna be making money or losing a little bit of money, the right thing to do is not screw this family yeah, out of their and house. The, and the biggest thing is you gotta remember as a real estate investor, and I know we're, we're going over and we'll, we'll get out of here in a second, uh, but is there's a reason that if you're ever to put in front of a judge against a homeowner or a tenant, and you're the, you're, there's a reason you're the big bad real estate investor. And that's because of the negative press that investors have gotten for the past gajillion years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's on you to try to give us a better name. Yeah, it's the, the, the biblical principle of being without reproach, uh, being above reproach. Like there should never be a question. If it comes down to, well, did they do the right thing? It should be, everybody should be able to be like, look, that totally could have happened, but I know Grant and I know that he wouldn't have done that. Right. So anyway, that's what we got. That's our show. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you liked it, like it. If you shared it, share it again. Um, that's Slow all I got. Slow my high five. Slow my high five out. We'll see you next time. <laughs>